let us look at a few more uh, aspects on premixed combustion. Uh, we will primarily be looking at flammability limits. and uh, this would lead to looking at uh, uh, quenching and ignition so these are things that we will start looking at uh, we will try to do this as quickly as possible uh, because we just do not have too much time to dwell in, in, into these the second thing is uh, you can understand that these are typically unsteady phenomena right we are talking about uh, the flame quenching near the flammability limit because it runs out of uh, uh, one of the reactants or uh, it, it gets quenched because of a thermal uh, heat loss um, or uh, the ignition again is a transient phenomenon and these are things that are not very well understood and uh, it is heavily kinetics dependent so uh, it, is, it is not amenable to simplified analysis uh, that uh, works very quite well uh, except for in, in a qualitative sense so this is kinetic, kinetics dependent. So what are we talking about as far as flammability limits is concerned uh, we know for example uh, that if you now try to plot the laminar flame speed versus the equivalence ratio um, it you have a curve that is uh, having a maximum somewhere in the middle a little bit uh, past equivalence ratio 1 and then it falls down and then it stops at uh, some point that means it is not really going all the way to down to 0. Um, it is stopping there which means that uh, you now have a fuel lean limit and a fuel rich limit right so this is uh, fuel lean limit and this is the fuel rich limit this is typical of most fuels the question then is what happens as we try to increase uh, uh, so to, or, uh, no, um, let me go back and say this is sometimes called referred to as the lower limit and this is sometimes referred to as the upper limit lower and upper meaning different values uh, the lower value of phi and the higher value of phi or uh, lower value of fuel, fuel R ratio or fuel oxidizer ratio versus higher value of fuel R or fuel oxidizer ratio. Um, now what we are interested in is trying to find out what these limits depend on and uh, mostly what we are talking the mixture ratio obviously is the, is, the, is the question. So the control parameters in any, any premix flame are the mixture ratio the uh, temperature and the pressure. So the question here is what is the lean mixture ratio lean limit mixture ratio or the rich limit mixture ratio depend on that means you need to be looking at what is the dependence on temperature and pressure. So the answer to the uh, initial temperature of the reactant mixture how it is going to affect the fuel uh, lean or fuel rich limit is uh, typically is linear so the, uh, the uh, flammability limits flammability limits uh, in, uh, vary I am saying vary instead of saying increase or decrease uh, because one of them increases the other one decreases uh, vary uh, linearly. Uh, with initial temperature right uh, that is enlarge as uh, temperature increases right so enlarge as in you can now expect as you increase the temperature the curve to go like that in a linear fashion and since this curve is not necessarily symmetric about phi equals 1 this gap is not the same as this right so typically this linearity is more steep with uh, fuel rich limit um, so more uh, more steeply more steeply uh, for uh, rich limit in fact this, this particular picture is a little bit wrong in that sense. So you need to have a, large, a larger increase in the upper limit when compared to a decrease in the lower limit. Uh, so that's what I meant by saying vary, uh, as in the, the upper limit increases further and the lower limit decreases further. Uh, 
So uh, more steeply for the rich limit than the lean limit. So what we are talking about as limit is again to emphasize it is the equivalence ratio or the fuel error ratio, fuel error uh, um, mass ratio. So if you now think about a linear variation so you should be able to now estimate like for example at 300k if you have a, a, li a lean limit like this and I, and I know how this variation is uh, in terms of like what is the slope of the uh, line that is connecting the temperature with the lean limit I should be able to predict what the uh, lean limit should be as you now advance your initial temperature to let us say 400 K right how, how it should decrease and so on okay. Um, now the more interesting thing is the pressure the pressure dependence okay. So the pressure dependence is more significant the sense it's not it's not so straightforward and um, nonlinear in some regimes and and uh, insensitive in some of the regimes so uh, particularly nonlinear nonlinear uh, for fuel rich limit at low pressures so it is sort of like uh, where we are in the pressure uh, equivalence ratio graph. So if you now look at uh, pressure and uh, equivalence ratio you are going to get a curve that is somewhat so you have a less uh, sensitive variation with uh, on the lean limit with pressure that means for a wide range of pressures you pretty much get about the same limit here or a, a mild variation and uh, that is not really the case in, in, in with, uh, with, with the rich limit. So here we are talking about phi and then there is like a wide variation where if you now go to a pressure that is below this limit it does not matter what your equivalence ratio is it is going to be like a flat curve. So this is your flammable region. and uh, this is your non flammable region you got to be careful in re uh, reading texts on this uh, for example I think the, con the conventional British English is uh, if you now say inflammable that means it burns it is not it is not a non burning thing right that is reason why we use the word non flammable rather than inflammable inflammable actually means it burns so that means it should be we should write that here. So to, to avoid the controversy you just use flammable and non-flammable. So now this this is actually this is again as I said you know it is kinetics dependent so here we could show I am not going to get into this uh, now this is actually uh, because of second order. And it takes at low pressures, and now it becomes linear. So here it's a nonlinear part, and then you now have a first order at higher pressures. Again, what are we talking about for the range? So somewhere in here, we are looking at atmospheric pressure. Okay, so we are looking at above and below atmosphere, and many times for this this part of the. Uh, uh, graph we would we would probably look at more like a linear scale whereas that part of the graph you would look at a logarithmic scale because you could strictly speaking even think about like uh, pressures that are going up to 100 bar or even more uh, for practical applications right and uh, sub atmospheric pressure is like between not exactly 0 you do not go to 0 pressure but let us say point not 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 1 and 2 up to what 1 1 atmosphere um, so you could, you could go over there the, the, the uh, ra sub atmospheric range course what we are talking about this is for typical hydrocarbons keep that in mind. The other thing that uh, that is going to lead us to the next topic that we want to talk about is uh, the, the, de the determination of the flammability limit is going to depend on the duct diameter okay. So one of the things that we were talking about is having a duct in which you allow for the flame to propagate but you now progressively make the fuel. 
uh, the, the, the mixture leaner and leaner and leaner or richer and richer and richer and then see at what point the flame refuses to propagate right and then you now obtain the limit. But this experiment will also depend on the diameter of the duct beyond below a certain value of the diameter right. So above a certain value of the diameter then the, 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 the flammability limits that you uh, determine become insensitive to the diameter of the duct but now we have to think about uh, the, the effect of the diameter of the duct so flammability limits are uh, influenced by duct diameter uh, duct diameter at uh, low pressure Uh, should I should say uh, below a certain value right at low pressure. So this, this so the, what this begins to mean is the duct diameter below which you are going to have a flammability limit being sensitive to the duct diameter is going to depend on pressure that means lower the pressure higher would be the duct diameter below which the flammability limit begins to become sensitive to, to uh, the duct diameter right. So this is a uh, this is typically at uh, lower pressure there are two things that can happen one is uh, the difficulty in ignition or quenching right. Or quenching that means if you could ignite it would quench or you would have difficulty in igniting to begin with right. So you get into that regime where uh, you, you, you have this problem and this is typically both in both the cases uh, difficulty in ignition or uh, propensity for quenching this is because of heat loss to the duct heat loss to the duct. So we will consider this a little bit more detail uh, next first let us consider quenching it is a little easier to deal with when compared to ignition uh, quenching so as the duct diameter decreases right um, a minimum diameter exists below which flame cannot propagate okay at given pressure and temperature right. So this is mainly due to uh, excessive heat loss to uh, the duct walls so uh, for the sake of simplicity instead of taking like a tube or a, uh, a duct we could just consider like uh, uh, a channel or, or two walls two parallel walls right so adopt a 2D geometry adopt a 2D geometry for simplicity to think about this that is parallel plates so if you now think about uh, right that looks like parallel plates does not it um, so we are now thinking about a a flame that is trying to propagate within this region and uh, it is releasing uh, heat Q or dot from the uh, from the chemical reactions and it is giving giving away Q L that is a loss so this R is for release and L is for loss to the walls right and 
the distance between these two these two plates is dq q for quenching so we are essentially looking for the quenching distance here so um, at uh, quenching uh, what we have is two things one is q or dot the rate of heat release which is uh, phi naught q r w dot and uh, a d q so a d q is actually the volume and a is like let us say the area of the plate if you can consider uh, a certain area in this and we will see that it does not matter we are looking we are going to ultimately look at what happens per unit area so uh, so for whatever area the area times d q is the volume over which you have the um, heat release that is going to the heat heat that is released that is going to get lost right. So uh, correspondingly if you now have a q l dot uh, this is actually heat heat lost by conduction right and uh, this is I am going to say approximately for a reason that will become very apparent right away. Uh, we have two walls and so you start with two area times k now, now let us suppose that uh, the temperature gradient can be replaced by a linear expression that is where the approximation comes from strictly speaking we should say dq dt by dx uh, at the wall and uh, look for a temperature profile between the walls and look at the gradient at the wall and so on but what we are essentially saying is tq is um, uh, TQ is is the quenching temperature temperature uh, in the flame that is to say if you now think about like this propagating downwards for example uh, you have reactants here and the reactants are supposed to be heated up to the flame temperature but that could actually happen probably uh, near the center of the flame and you could have a fairly higher temperature that is reached for the products but on the sides closer to the walls the reactants are not getting heated up all the way to the adiabatic flame temperature because you now have heat loss therefore the temperature that is actually attained for the products is not, not going to be really tf like a adiabatic flame temperature rather it is going to be tq okay so there is a temperature distribution that is happening uh, across and uh, what we are looking for is like a quenching temperature that means you need to have the, the reactants raised at least up to a certain temperature beyond which it can actually have appreciable reactions going on right. So in other words you now try to actually try to have a flame held near the wall you will find that there is still a standoff that means you do not have reactions happening right at the flame okay and what, the, what this really means is the in this standoff the temperature is actually increasing from the wall temperature to like a TQ within a very very short distance maybe about a few millimeters or less and uh, um, that means you now have a reasonable temperature gradient between the wall and the standoff distance which is going to now feed this uh, heat flux and that is the reason why the wall is getting heated up. If the wall were uh, at a high temperature to begin with right then you would not have too much heating. So in fact this is one of the reasons why you need to think of typically these are all things that we that people have to bother about if they are setting up experiments because experimentalists are the ones who are going to uh, deal with I mean most experiments are on steady state problems or oscillatory even if it is transient very very few people are actually doing experiments on quenching itself but those people who are uh, interested in actually having steady state flames in their experiments want to make sure that it does not quench right or uh, want to make sure want to make sure that the walls that they are actually using in the experimental setup when it is subjected to flame does not melt right. So typically what is happening is if you now use like a ceramic wall for example right it, it is it is an insulator so it does not really take away all the heat right instead it is actually getting heated up by itself and it is incre it's increasing its temperature and because it is increasing its temperature this difference comes down and therefore uh, you, you have less heat that is going in that is typically how insulators work it is a, a heat transfer uh, 
thing. The only thing is we have to make sure that the insulator is able to withstand the temperature to which it is raised so that the conduction is decreased and uh, that ceramic does that job for you therefore uh, that is how it works otherwise if it is like a metal wall it is going to get heated up progressively because of this and it is going to stop the flame of a rise in temperature right and there is like a limit temperature that you should be thinking about beyond which you are not going to have any appreciable reactions. Similarly phi naught here is of course uh, the stoichiometry stoichiometry that is uh, how much of the fuel for a given amount of air is reacting QR of course is the is the heating uh, heat of reaction and uh, W dot is uh, the reaction rate let us say assuming a single step reaction or essentially putting together uh, QR and W dot we are looking at what is the chemical heat release rate these two together right. So, uh, so now if you say at quenching uh, we have um, QR dot is of the same order or equal to Q L dot then you now put these two together um, you are going to get of course the area cancels therefore we should have been looking at per unit area to begin with. So dQ squared is equal to um, dQ squared is equal you have a 2 here and a 2 at the bottom the figure 4 4 k tq minus t naught divided by phi naught w qr but qr is equal to uh, cp tf minus t naught this is as if you know what we are thinking is approximately you have a temperature profile that is inclined linearly uh, near the walls and reaching up to tf in the middle okay and uh, it, it, it is stopping at around TQ there and then from there you, you, you are now having a uh, heat, uh, heat loss. So this is like a bulk analysis we are not looking at the spatial variation uh, in the temperature. So you would like to think that the flame is actually having a uh, flame temperature TF up to which you need to have the heat release heated up but that heat is now going to go away from a value of TQ to the wall temperature by conduction uh, as a loss. Therefore, if you now plug this in, you now get so this, this is an approximate uh, uh, analysis, of course, and I will show you where the approximation comes from as we go along in comparison with experimental data. Um, so, if you now say 4k divided by phi w times Cp Tq minus T naught divided by uh, Tf minus T naught. So um, we, we have alpha the thermal diffusivity as uh, K divided by rho naught Cp uh, rho naught is the upstream reactant gas density. Um, so we see that uh, dQ dQ is proportional to square root of uh, alpha divided by W dot does not it look a bit similar I mean have you seen this somewhere right obviously uh, we know that we know that SL goes as square root of alpha W dot right. So we had something like square root of KW dot divided by CP that is how it was going and you had a 1 over rho naught uh, outside the square root. So if you now put that together you will now have something that is going as alpha, alpha W dot we have seen this also before okay. Uh, so if you now put these two together then uh, what, 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 what basically remains is SL DQ. Uh, is proportional to alpha and that is to say alpha I mean alpha is like a is a, is a thermophysical uh, 
uh, constant for the material. So what what we are, what what this basically means for you is dQ is alpha over SL. Or in other words, larger the SL, right, lower the quenching diameter. Right. What that means is if a flame is going to propagate fast it is going to go through a duct which is of a smaller diameter that means you need to have a still smaller diameter for quenching the flame right. So that simply means that the flame is trying to propagate more vigorously and you need to squeeze it into a smaller duct right. Um, to give you numbers on uh, how this works out so for uh, for typical hydrocarbon for typical hydrocarbon uh, fuels between uh, parallel plates um, dQ is around 1.8 millimeters right and uh, you can look up the actual values for let us say circular ducts. Uh, in the literature for exact fuels and so on there is uh, these things are catalogued and that is pretty important for you when you are trying to devise experiments with, on premix flames for example you want to make sure that the flame does not flash back uh, from where you want to stabilize it in your experiment or if it does then you need to be able to quench it before it actually gets to the source right. So many times in experimental setups you have something like a, a, a settling chamber into which you would mix your uh, fuel and oxidizer or fuel and air and then let it through a duct into which you want to stabilize this and if you have a flashback the flame can go all the way down and in, into the settling chamber and this settling chamber is now like a constant volume combustion uh, region where it can actually explode and uh, we have had a couple of such things happen in our labs right when, when students are not really careful enough I should not say that they, they go through calculations on having a small a, 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 a array of uh, tubes to actually quench the uh, flame as it tries to propagate if, if it is not a good calculation the calculation is wrong sometimes or uh, they, they have made some assumptions or put in incorrect values like on the flame speed for example if it is if they are doing calculations for a phi, phi that is equal to 0.7 but actually they ha t turn out like um, depending upon how the sequence in which you close your valves at the end of the experiment you might locally get into a stoichiometric mixture that propagates faster right and it can go inside right. Uh, so typically you are looking at uh, capillary tubes like stainless steel tubes that are about 2 millimeters in diameter and then you now try to stack them up in an array like in a hexagonal close pack structure kind of thing so that you form like a honeycomb thing and uh, you, you now insert it in your inlet and this acts not only as a flow straightener for the flow that is going into the uh, into this duct from the settling chamber but it is also more importantly for us uh, from a combustion point of view and from a safety point of view and from a quenching point of view it is acting as a flame arrester. So this is what is called as a flame arrester uh, um, typically in, in uh, crude Bunsen burners that you want to put together you would also have something like metal balls that are thrown in there small metal balls such that the, the uh, voids between the metal balls are of this order or you could also put some steel wool uh, just, just uh, crimp some steel wool and then just uh, pack it inside. Uh, this will also straighten the flow it is like a porous medium and also arrest the flame from propagating upstream right. So these are all typical uh, approaches to flame arrest, arresting based on uh, the idea of uh, quenching. Of course what happens is uh, there are lots of applications where it is uh, I should say uh, for example there are uh, there are these applications where you want to have some nice um, uniform heating in, in some place like in, in uh, uh, gas heaters where you want to try to heat and uh, uh, like, like room heaters or uh, uh, water heaters in, in large furnaces and so on or large uh, boilers you want to have like a very nice uh, uniform way by which you want to stabilize the flame without getting into turbulence and so on. So there is like a small there is an array of lot of small ducts through which you could actually send in fuel and stabilize the flame because flame stabilization is a big issue right. So when you now get into turbulent flames 
uh, trying to stabilize the flame with a larger duct may be difficult so you actually use smaller ducts and at that time you could even think about like a porous plate or a small the, these very small fine ducts into which you can send in this and stabilize the flame that means you have very very small uh, lots of tiny premix flames that are that are stabilized on these and the question there is you could still stabilize the flame if you are if you are having a sustained ignition to begin with and you now heat up this this array of ducts right and once the uh, duct is heated up and the temperature is now higher then it is going to be able to sustain this. So there this difference comes into picture right so you are now trying to increase the wall temperature with the flame itself for some time and then the flame will sustain there without really getting quenched or, or, or flash back and quench right. So, uh, such, such things are uh, done in, in practice in, in, many, in some applications. Uh, the next thing we should think about is uh, ignition. So at this stage I should uh, uh, state uh, a couple of rules of thumb kind of uh, criteria for ignition which we will which you will see works the reverse of uh, the, the, the flame uh, extinction that we, that we have been talking about. So Williams this is actually following Williams um, rules of thumb uh, criteria. ignition and uh, reverse holds good for uh, extinction right. The first thing is if you now imagine like a slab of slab of gas slab of reactant gas we are now beginning to talk about ignition that means you do not have a flame yet right. So you have to now think about a slab of gas that is approximately equal to the flame thickness right and you need to have an ignition source that now in a sustained manner increases this temperature of this reactant gas up to the flame temperature right. So that is that is the that is the uh, criterion number one um, so the the ignition source should raise the temperature of uh, a slab of reactant gas of thickness of the order of uh, the flame thickness of the order of the flame thickness uh, to the flame temperature for ignition. So you can see that if you now already had a flame which had a flame temperature then this really means that the temperature has to be brought down from that value for, for in order for it to get quenched right that is what we were talking about as the difference between TQ and TF and you can see that it is not going to be as low as T0 which is the initial temperature or the temperature of the wall right. So obviously the ignition is not going to work exactly the same as quenching and that is what I was beginning to say um, I guess I did not really um, pursue that so far when you are now saying that uh, you have DQ is going as alpha over SL right it is not just this dependence that matters what is the coefficient right. The coefficient is actually coming all the way from uh, these things right and what I would like to point out is you had a 4 sitting here in reality we are using something like a DQ over 2 that is like half the distance is corresponding to a heat loss to one plate half the distance is corresponding to a heat loss to the other plate right. Then there is something called a notion of a, a heat loss penetration. So the, 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 the idea that we have used here is the penetration distance is equal to half the quenching distance that means the penetration of the heat loss is equally from both sides all the way up to the middle is, is what we are saying. But empirically if you think about this this is not really 2 
it turns out to be actually more than 2 that means you do not necessarily have to have a large penetration distance ok you do not have to actually have a penetration all the way to, uh, to, to, to the middle of the uh, of this this is significantly larger than 2 ok. So, you are not going to get something like 4 it could be much more than that uh, we are all we are ok on an order of magnitude, but uh, this is this is this could be like for example 8 if you if it is 8 and like it is about off by 4 times you see. So, for 4 or 5 times is typically how this is going to be. So, as a first cut we would like to think this is what it is, but you do not need to necessarily penetrate that much even a little bit penetration of the loss the heat loss is sufficient to actually bring down the temperature to uh, to, to like a TQ which is going to quench this right. On the other hand the the ignition is now going to require for you to actually heat up the temperature significantly. It is not like a small loss in temperature uh, that causes quenching it is going to be a significant rise in the, 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 the temperature by ignition source um, for you to be able to ignite. So, this is as the first criterion the second criterion is on the heat loss. So, the rate of liberation of heat here when you are talking about ignition we talk about liberation of heat instead of loss. Uh, so, the rate of liberation of uh, heat I am sorry this this is this this rate of liberation of heat is about the from the chemical reaction. So, by chemical reaction I meant to think of rate of liberation of heat from the ignition source, but um, when you try to ignite then you need to initiate chemical reactions because of the increase in temperature meeting the first criterion and those that the heat released from the chemical reaction uh, inside the slab the same slab that we are talking about must be uh, must approximately balance approximately balance uh, the rate of heat loss let me just use this other panel uh, rate, of, rate of heat loss uh, heat loss um, from the slab by conduction right. So, it is a it is a very similar idea as uh, what we are uh, what, what we what we are thinking we will get pretty much we will pretty much use these kinds of expressions, uh, but I would like to show you through a little bit more rigorous analysis just a little bit more not 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 significantly rigorous more rigorous, but this is like a global heat balance if you will right. We are not talking about um, a spatial variation, but if it is possible for us to actually think about how locally the temperature gradient is going to get set up right. And uh, so, that means you use like a, a dt by dx instead of having having this this kind of a linear expression for the temperature gradient um, for, for a for a global uh, temperature variation you now try to actually look at how the temperature variation happens and uh, take that into account for the heat loss and then that means we since we now have like a, a derivative like you have to worry, worry about a dt by dx and then that means we can integrate that and so on. So, let us do all those things next class.